my way of thinking, the most suggestive sentence in Professor Cavaro's book was an observation that the effect of immigration in, upon the United States has been to increase the proportion of the poor who are not citizens. The political ramifications of this observation seem to me to be very large and very profound, and that is what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, both Phil and Michael have talked about some of the sources of progressive and liberal enthusiasm for wider immigration. And I think they, everything they've identified is correct. Um, but uh, progressives are not quite as soft-hearted and soft-headed as Phil suggests. I'm not a progressive. Um, there is an element of political calculation at work as well, that what they believe um, is that they will, by increasing the number of newcomers to the United States who are poor and who are predominantly non-white, they will build the emerging democratic majority. That was the title of a famous book by my friend Rudy Teixeira and his co-author John Judas. Um, centrist authors like Ron Brownstein, my colleague uh, in, at The Atlantic, have observed this as well. Um, often in American politics, it is, uh, the, it is written as if it is somehow an automatic thing that the electorate is going to change, and it's going to change in ways that it is assumed are favorable to Democrats. And Republicans will have to adjust, and adjust in ways that progressive find, find congenial. The Republicans will have to become a more racially diverse coalition, more ethnically diverse coalition, a coalition more accepting of multiculturalism. And so that is the political win. Uh, that is hoped for from this giant demographic change. And my observation uh, to progressives is this is an extremely naive way to think about how politics works. Um, politics does not move in smooth, steady increments. It is not a set of uh, clockwork. It is a very um, dynamic uh, force with, um, uh, with feedback effects that are uh, going to um, surprise. Uh, the authors of this change. Let me point, start with Europe, as Michael suggests, and then move to the United States. Um, Europe is in deep economic malaise uh, since, the, um, since about 2010, driven by the Euro crisis and by deeper rigidities in, of its economy um, uh, behind that. Uh, unemployment through the Eurozone is about 11 percent. In Italy, which is now the main immigration receiving country, uh, immig unemployment is about 13 percent. Among young people, there's uh, a lot of younger People in Southern Europe have just given up on the formal labor market, so we can't really be sure how many of them are unemployed. But it's a good guess that in Southern Europe, it's probably a quarter to a third of people under age 30 who are um, out of work. Certainly, they are out of the formal labor market. What is the response? Across Europe, we are seeing the rise of anti-party nationalist parties. Um, Sometimes they're called far right. Sometimes, at Syriza in Greece, they're called far left. Um, but I think they all have, you know, I think they have much more in common. I think the national, to me, the National Front and the Scots Nationalists look very similar because what they are are parties that they basically call for two things. One is to assert the interests of the old stock inhabitants of the nation. And in particular, they're interested to defend such portions of the welfare state as defend them. They are right-wing parties, but they are parties that defend the welfare state as it existed in, say, 1980, in the interests of the people who lived in Europe in 1980 and their children. I call these parties of incumbent claims. Um, and, they, and they are the most dynamic force in, in Europe. Uh, you might be misled by the British um, election, for example, in which the UK Independence Party saw its, its number of seats. They'd, had, they'd hoped for a big breakthrough in numbers of seats, and they were disappointed. But their share of the vote rose to 13 percent, an unprecedented Hi. UKIP, again, is identified often as a right-wing party, and there's a certain amount of libertarian rhetoric about them. But when you look at what they stand for, uh, they stand, it's the same thing that uh, the Scots Nationalists, the same thing that Syriza stands for. Um, it, it is the defense of the welfare state for people already here by excluding those who might come. And this really should not surprise us. The effect of immigration is uh, to introduce um, ethnic competition. Now, you might believe, I think as a progressive Phil believes, and I, I partly believe this myself, that a lot of ethnicity is a completely imaginary construction. And these are imagined communities in the famous phase of the great Marxist theorist uh, Benedict um, Anderson. But the things, our minds are hardwired to perceive these um, groups whether or not they have any deep and transcendental meaning, in the same way that our minds are hardwired to perceive uh, the, the hues of the uh, spectrum, even though they may not have any independent objective reality. That is the way we are made. Um, and in the competition between these groups, what you see is that um, this inter-ethnic 
competition displaces the traditional organization of European politics around class. Um, parties of the class uh, based on class are fading. Parties based on ethnicity are rising. Look what has happened to British Labour. Look at what has happened to the French Socialists. Look at what has happened to the Italian Social Democrats. They are being crowded out uh, by. Um, uh, they are either being crowded out by, or are being converted into parties that represent the newcomers. And the old stock inhabitants are coalescing, regardless of their uh, traditionally um, at variance economic interests, into new parties to defend incumbent claims. And I think we see that in the in the United States as well. Um, uh, I have been, um, I'm a Republican, I've not been a big fan of, of the Tea Party movement in the United States because it seems to me that that is what the Tea Party movement is. Again, it ha there's a lot of libertarian rhetoric about the Tea Party movement, but when the demand that organized them, that brought them into being, uh, was the uh, Obamacare and the threat to the existing Medicare program. Uh, the Ob uh, Obamacare, it, when it was introduced in uh, the first couple of years of the um, administration was a straightforward transfer of health care resources from old stock inhabitants to newcomers. As I learned from S Center for Immigration Studies, of those who were uninsured in 2010, about a third, a little, a little less than a third, were foreign born. Uh, meanwhile, Medicare covers everyone over 65, a population that is overwhelm overwhelmingly native born and, and heavily, heavily white. Um, everything the Republican Party has done uh, its central ideas since 2010 have been to, def uh, to defend the interests of the old stock inhabitants, the claims, not the interests, the claims. And the most extreme, and to some degrees, I mean, so extreme as to be almost parody, was, was the Ryan plan, which called for absolutely no change to Medicare for anyone over 55. I'm 54. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, no claim change to Medicare for any, and that, the baby boom, get the baby boom population, t sa satiate them, and then draconian cuts to go into ever increasing effect uh, in Medicare for those under age 55, uh, all of it in order to finance a uh, tax cut for the P Republican Party's upmarket supporters. Um, it was a coalition of the old and the rich against newcomers. Now, why are the old and the rich in the same coalition? Um, it is because of the competitive force of, of uh, the perceived uh, claims of newcomers. I, I want to take this out of the realm of morality and abstract right because I don't, I don't think those things belong in politics. I think, you know, politics is what you can organize to get. There is no just distribution. This is where I'm not a progressive. There is no inherently just distribution, or if there is, I, I couldn't tell you what it is. Let me put it that way. Um, but through mobilization, um, people make claims. And the, the effect of this on the United States and on the politics of the United States, I, I think it's not just a phenomenon of the post-2010 uh, Obamacare um, followed. It's not just a phenomenon of the Great Recession, although those two things may be aggravating. I think it's a deeper thing. And let me direct your attention to the politics of a state that has been one of the biggest immigration receiving states in the country, or one of the steepest, I should say, steepest in a sense, and that's the state of North Carolina. Traditionally one of the most moderate states in the American South, um, st uh, a state of people like Terry Sanford and, and James Hunt, um, the, the great hope, the, gr uh, the great home of the more conservative, the, the homeland of the more conservative Democrats, and of course the site of the um, most recent Democratic National uh, Convention. Now, this has been a state that, uh, from 1992 through 2012, elected Democratic governors in the Bill Clinton mode. Um, Pro-business, invest in education, um, some degree of maintain a social safety net, but really focus on colleges and universities. And uh, the state went for Barack Obama in 2008. The Democratic Party in the state has, has been, and despite the huge increase in the ethnic diversity of North Carolina in, since the year 2000. The state has become more and more and more conservative. Um, a state that, uh, I mean, it went for Romney in 2012, of course. It now has a Republican governor after 20 years of Democratic governors. It historically balanced one Democratic and one Republican U.S. Senator. It now has two. A decade ago, the state's delegation was uh, in the House was evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. Now it is 10 of 13. Um, uh, that are Republican, and the, the three who are Democrat are preserved by the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and in 2010, Republicans took both houses of the North Carolina State Assembly for the first time since the 1890s. Um, and I, now, that may not be there forever, as the children and grandchildren of the recent immigrants 
gain status and gain the right to vote, they may organize to vote in such a way that in the 2030s or 2040s, um, North Carolina may, may change, or maybe not, because who can predict what the politics of the future are going to look like? Um, as discussed at breakfast with Paul Donnelly, that the uh, children and grandchildren of Roosevelt's voters found it very easy to vote for Nixon and Reagan in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, we can't predict the future, but what we can see happening now is the emerging, the emerging democratic majority is not emerging because it is creating its equal and opposite effect. And, and I, in some ways, I, I, I'm a beneficiary of this, I am a Republican, but what concerns me is that the way traditional majority, the, the old majority of the country organizes to defend itself is in some ways through greater mobilization. This is the Republican advantage. Um, there are more potential Democrats in the country, but the Republicans are the party of people who pay their cable bill on the day it arrives. Um, it is easier to get our people to the polls than it is uh, the Democratic team. As, you, as we see in presidential elections, there's a, it is a huge effort of mobilization to bring Democrats to the polls. In years when Democrats are excited, like 2008, um, they come in huge numbers and win decisively. Barack Obama dropped, I think, three and a half million votes between 2008 and 2012. It's my perception that Hillary Clinton will be an even less exciting candidate for Democrats than uh, the 2012 Barack Obama was, and there will be even greater mobilization difficulties. But Republicans are also responding by changing the rules of the game to protect their incumbent claims. And that's what incumbents do. That's what the voter ID debate is about. Um, and uh, there, we're going to see uh, that, that is what um, the Republican view on the way campaign finance should be. There are no Republicans now who favor campaign finance restrictions. There used to be. Um, they are building into the system new rules uh, to, uh, to protect their people. Parties do that. Democrats do the same. They get rid of voter ID laws. Uh, they make it easier to register when you get your driver's license. <laughs> Um, I, uh, uh, parties compete in that way. Uh, but it unleashes a particularly unhealthy kind of competition, and there's one that Democrats, Monty Python has a sketch about um, hitting in the head lessons, uh, that, uh, that you wonder how many hitting in the head lessons it will take to understand that politics does not happen automatically. Uh, politics is the result of human mobilization and a reaction to perceived opportunities and perceived threats. Um, the progressive case for, Im for immigration rests on a misreading of the political consequences of immigration in the near term. Um, and uh, that is not a point that you make in your book, and um, I think that's because as you, said, you are obviously a person who has a very you know, generous view of human nature. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> you mean naive. Um, well, no, because it, it's sometimes true, and maybe it's true. It, it, it's true enough of the time uh, that it's a valid way to look. But one of the things that conservatism teaches us, I think, is to have a more suspicious view uh, of human nature, and therefore urges us not to test that nature too much with too many strains. Um, we are making many tests in Europe and in the United States today. Um, we're making t many tests. We are pressing uh, the population's inco income, we are pressing the population's role in politics, we are testing people in a way, and we're testing political stability in a way that I think it is dangerous to test it.